Um, good afternoon. I want to uh, thank the staff at the Asian Art Museum for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I am very excited to share with you the information that I've put together for this presentation. And as Deborah mentioned, um, I'm actually a specialist in the Japanese art of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and so, although the program is titled um, Looking West Japanese Visual Culture After uh, since 1850, I'm actually going to be talking about art that was produced primarily in the period that exactly parallels the exhibition downstairs. So I'm going to be talking about from the 1860s uh, through about 1910 or so. Um, and I am going to talk um, in, uh, about basically three major components, um, the first of which is going to be titled First Encounters, and then the second and third are called Modernization. I'm going to be talking about a couple of different facets of modernization that's taking place in Japan at the same time. Um, So I'd like to begin by just giving a very, very brief historical introduction. And um, I've prepared the talk today um, with the hunch that most visitors to this museum would be pretty familiar with the traditional arts of Japan, uh, but maybe not so familiar with what is happening during the Meiji period, the period from 1868 to 1912 or so, because this is when there are a lot of disruptions and a lot of changes to conventional traditional Japanese art. So if you've looked at the exhibition, um, you know a little bit about this background history. Um, essentially, Japan was largely closed to contact or interactions with the West for almost 250 years from a period in the early 17th century until the arrival of Perry in the 1850s. The map that you're looking at here on the right-hand side gives you uh, an idea of the geography of Japan. And the left-hand side is an illustration that is uh, a Western capturing of the small man-made island of Deshima, which was actually right off the coast of Nagasaki all the way down in the southern part of Japan. So any Western contact that the Japanese had from the period of the 1630s through the 1850s was actually filtered through the port of Deshima. Or Dejima. Um, as some of the signage in the exhibitions mentions, um, this is not to say that there was actually no Western influence in the arts at all, because in fact there was a little bit, but it was very inconsistent. It was by no means universally applied to the arts of Japan. All of that starts to change with the arrival of Perry in 1853. Um, as you also may know from the signage, uh, Perry arrives in Japan, sent by the US government, um, to basically kind of force Japan to open to trade with the West. He sails away with his black ships and then returns the next year in 1854. And at that time, the Japanese uh, military government, the shogunate, did agree to open up to start to trade with and engage with the West. And so that leads to a period that's known in Japanese as the Bakumatsu period, which lasts from 1854 until 1868. And this is a short and very dynamic period which starts to see the Japanese opening up for contact and for trade with the West. So the first um, art movement that I would like to uh, convey today has to do with precisely this moment. Um, following on the idea that it is actually uh, one specific port location that gives rise to this particular genre, um, let me just go back very briefly to the map. If you look just below Tokyo on the right-hand side, there is the city of Yokohama, which is maybe 20 miles or so south. And um, this was not the only port to first open. There were several others, but this is the one that really saw the biggest influx of kind of new visual information. And that information gave rise to a school that was known as Yokohama A, or Yokohama Woodblock Prints. In fact, the very first print in the exhibition is an example of this type of art. Um, and these are woodblock prints. Um, as woodblock prints, the production process uh, is exactly identical to what the ukiyo-e, traditional woodblock printing process, was for woodblock prints that so dominated visual culture for the previous roughly two centuries. Um, and so the things to understand about that is that woodblock prints, by their very nature, were a very commercial entity. So um, sales were the big thing that publishers were interested in. And when publishers commissioned designs, the artists that produced them 
you know, they had to produce designs that would sell very well. Um, to do that, even in the preceding Edo period, the aspect of novelty was always very important. So in the Yokohama A Print School, the novelty now is looking at the new foreign information, the new kinds of foreign people and ideas that were starting to arrive in Japan at this time. Um, and so to repeat, this is an exhibition, uh, a print that you can see in the exhibition from 1861, and it actually shows you, uh, especially on the top right and the left, examples of foreign figures. And so there were, in fact, a lot of prints that were produced under this school. The school did not last for very long, uh, very short-lived production period from about 1860 through 1864 or so was when the majority of these prints were made. Um, as the subjects, the print artists are looking at the new foreign ideas and information and people that are arriving in the port of Yokohama. But it's especially important to understand that a lot of times the artists didn't have first-hand experience of what these people look like or what, you know, what they were doing. And so there's a lot of kind of fantasy that is built into this particular style of printmaking. Um, what you see here is a three-part woodblock print triptych that is showing you the arrival of five nations. And what that refers to is the fact that um, there were five particular Western nations that the Japanese negotiated trade treaties with in the later 1850s and 1860s. And these were the United States, Great Britain, Russia, France, and the Dutch, who they already obviously had a bit of a relationship with. Um, and so in prints like these, you see these representatives of the different cultures in different countries actually landing in Japan. The ones that I think personally are a little bit more interesting, um, you might not say these are the most aesthetically pleasing of woods, woodblock prints, and if you're familiar with more traditional prints, you might think that actually there is a kind of grotesque element to them sometimes. But they capture this kind of excitement about the new people arriving. Um, there were uh, some number of print series that were issued called prints or people of the five nations that would show representative people of each of those different five different Western uh, trade partners. So here you're looking at on the left an example of the French and on the right the Russians. Um, again, to repeat, typically the artists are not really actually having first-hand knowledge of the subjects that they're portraying. And so you see, of course, the most kind of stereotypical um, representation of clothing or of um, habits or practices that that culture might be known for. So on the left, what do the French do? They drink wine, right? And on the right, you see a very typical kind of um, you know, heavy-duty Russian winter garments on these people. The script on these is actually capturing phonetic um, transliterations of the foreign words into Japanese, so that the Japanese might be able to understand something of that foreign language. Um, as we are in the United States, I have chosen a couple that also represent Americans. The Americans are one of the five trade countries. So both of these are intended to represent Americans. Um, on the left-hand side, um, this headgear that you see the woman wearing actually comes up in a lot of prints, and I like to refer to it as the pineapple crown, um, but you can probably imagine it's meant to capture a Native American headdress, right? Um, and then on the right-hand side, you can actually see in Romanized letters um, a transliteration of the word for America. And the right-hand side is supposed to depict a family basically strolling around, presumably, the port of Yokohama. Um, so it's really the kind of exotic new subject matter that was the feature and the novelty aspect of this particular print school. Um, and let me just point out, in all of these prints, you might be noticing a really kind of awkward attempt at shading. This is one of the things that represents a new illustrative technique that the Japanese artists are trying to kind of absorb into these, um, this particular subject matter. So, for example, on the clothing of her dress on the right-hand side, or excuse me, rather the left-hand side, um, and also the kind of awkward darker patches on the, on the horse. These are all examples of that. Uh, beyond the Five Nations theme, there are a lot of other kind of fantastical uh, examples of Western cities, Western subject matters that find their way into these prints. And so again, keeping with my theme of America, I want to show you two of these. Um, the print artist imagined rather fantastical ideas about foreign places. Um, and what you're looking at here is imagined to be the United States. Um, this is from a series called The Complete Enumeration of Scenic Places in Foreign Nations, the City of Washington in America. Um, the architecture 
is kind of a mishmash of styles. You may or may not think that you can actually identify something from this particular architectural representation. But funny enough, it turns out that the source for this material is similar to the sources for a lot of these visual images. As I mentioned a couple of times, the artists are not coming into first-hand contact, obviously, with these places, nor the people. So where are they getting their ideas? From printed images that are circulating in Japan. And in the case of this particular triptych, the source image depicts not the United States at all, but actually a city of Agra in India. And if you look carefully at the architecture on the right-hand side, you'll notice that the print artist has kind of split it down the middle and put part of it on the right-hand side and part of it on the left-hand side of the print there. So again, there's a lot of kind of fantastical interpretations of uh, what, the f what the West might look like and, and what it's like outside the, the boundaries of Japan. Um, you might have noticed in that previous print, hot air balloons, and this is actually a, another theme that comes up quite often. Um, here you are looking at a scene of America which envisions that hot air balloons are the mechanism by which everybody travels around, more or less. Um, the text in the middle of this, or rather to the right, says uh, what they call the balloon is like a steamship that flies. It is the foremost conveyance of foreign nations. Um, and this, is, this particular print is believed to have been inspired by the fact that in 1860, uh, two hot air balloons with the flags of US, Japan, and Britain were actually launched from Philadelphia to commemorate the opening of Japan. So again, the sources the artists are kind of synthesizing and incorporating into their works come from kind of timely news, but there is just a great deal of misunderstanding and, and really misinterpretation related to this. So that's the first stage that I wanted to introduce today. And again, Yokohama A are prints that are very short-lived but capture this first kind of moment of excitement when Japan is you know, starting to encounter the West and Western ideas. Um, once Japan's first official modern period really starts, that's in 1868 with the opening of the Meiji era, um, we see some rather different interpretations and incorporations of Western subject matter and Western ideas. Um, and again, I'd like to give just a very, very brief kind of um, overview of what happens at this time. So that first phase from 1854 to 1868 sees the opening of a couple of key port cities and a kind of gradual relationship built between Western nations and the Japanese. But in 1867, leading into 1868, the Japanese actually undergo a major uh, kind of political revolution where the emperor, was restored as the official head of state. Um, if you know your Japanese history, you might know that that period prior, the Edo period, actually saw a military rule, the shogun, who was actually the head of state. Um, the emperor, during that more or less 250 years, had been stashed away in the imperial compound in Kyoto. But as part of the new open modern Japan, the emperor is now restored as head of state, officially becomes the head of state. And so what starts to happen in this period is rather than foreign ideas and foreign subject matters as artistic inspiration, instead there is a very sort of, sort of serious and significant looking at the West, uh, both artistically and in other areas of culture and society, and incorporating Western technology, Western ideas into Japanese culture, trying to synthesize them together. Um, nowhere can you see this Perhaps the most significant example is in photographs of the Meiji Emperor himself that were taken in 1872 and 1873 that you can see here. Um, this is actually a set of images that was prompted or requested by the Iwakura mission, which is the first uh, official Japanese mission sent abroad to start to gather information on the West, but also to um, start to build diplomatic context, basically. So the Iwakura mission arrived first in the US and then the UK, uh, Great Britain and France, and they learned that it was the custom for heads of state in the West at this time to exchange portrait photographs. And so they wrote back to Japan and asked if they could have such a photograph made of the emperor. And that first example that you see here is on the left-hand side is the one that was made. Um, obviously, he is wearing traditional clothing. And when members of this diplomatic mission saw this photograph, you know, they realized it was really not the image of Japan that they wanted to share with the rest of the world, and so they requested the second photograph, which you see here on the right-hand side. Um, Meiji Emperor was not very fond of being photographed or posing for images, and so this was actually on the right-hand side, the official image of him for quite some time, uh, nearly two decades until the next official image was made. Um, so the next 
two stages that I'm going to talk about are examples, again, of the Japanese actually deliberately kind of integrating foreign, e foreign ideas, foreign information, foreign technologies into their own culture. Um, it is key to understand that in the 1870s and early 1880s, the impetus for doing this is they really wanted to kind of prove to the West that they were not this backwards, feudal nation. Um, one of the uh, negative consequences of the way in which Japan was opened was that they uh, ended up uh, negotiating what were known as the unequal treaties. So they were actually at a dis distinct disadvantage in ter terms of economic and trade policies. And they want to try to renegotiate that so they can, you know, kind of be on more of a par with the Western cultures, Western countries. So artistic um, advances during this period are absolutely part of that change. So uh, again, of the, fr the second of the two categories I'm going to uh, give you a little introduction to today continues to be woodblock prints, but these are now known as a type of print called kaika e, or civilization and enlightenment prints. Um, indeed, the phrase bunmei kaika, civilization and enlightenment, was one that the government actively promoted as part of this process of trying to show the rest of the world that they were in fact kind of up to date themselves and not, you know, not a backwards feudal nation. Um, Kaika A, Civilization Enlightenment Prints, really flourished from the 1870s through the end of the 1880s. Um, instead of the first initial kind of, you know, shock, surprise, and exotic exoticization of the other that you see in the Yokohama A, um, instead you start to see a lot of new Western-influenced elements in these prints. Um, to give the two examples that you're looking at here, these are both examples that show us new uh, uses of railway technology in Japan. Um, on the left-hand side, the uh, Shinagawa Railway, and on the right-hand side, Shimbashi Station. These are both in the greater environs of Tokyo. Um, as you look at these, it's not just um, the rail itself that is something that's new and symbolizes new Western technology, but actually the architecture as well. So on the right-hand side, for example, you can see a brick building uh, to the right-hand side of that print. This is also new. Clothing, just like the emperor transformed his clothing from traditional wear, to a Western military-style military uniform. Um, you see common everyday people, or men especially, doing this as well. And so the figures in the foreground of these prints, you can see that change in their style also. Um, in addition to technologies such as railways, building technologies, new Western-style architecture, you also have a number of new cultural practices that the Japanese adapt during this period, and many of these find their way into woodblock prints as well. Um, this print is another one that's actually in the exhibition downstairs. Um, it shows a opening scene of a new racetrack, um, and you can actually see the emperor as well as the imperial entourage for the empress on the right-hand side of this print. Um, and again, let me draw your attention to him. I'm sorry, I don't think I actually have a pointer that works here, but you know, he's to the right-hand third, and then she's all the way on the side there. Although his cl clothing changed as of 1873, hers did not. She would still go out with her ladies-in-waiting in imperial court dress. But at long last, nearly 15 years later, um, she changed her style of dress in 1886. This pen is my pointer. Okay, thank you. There we go. Um, fall of 1886, she finally changed her style of dress, and you can see that reflected here as she and her entourage are arriving at uh, one of the national expositions that was put on uh, increasingly popular during this time. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about her, and um, you might hear some aspects that kind of resonate uh, maybe in inverse ways with some of the text and images that are um, on display downstairs. So it was actually a very important and kind of deliberate part of the presentation of the imperial family, their manner of dress. Uh, obviously for the emperor himself, this was key as he was the figurehead for the state. But indeed for, the, for, for his wife, for the empress, um, it's not just that her clothing changed, but actually her role as well is so dramatically different from anything that had happened before. Um, it was of course not the custom in pre-modern Japan for uh, the wife of the emperor to go to official events with him or anything like that. But as part of this idea of trying to convey civilization and enlightenment, um, she is forced into that role, basically. And so her changing her dress is, again, part of this, that she is, um, you know, urged to be put forward as a kind of face of the modern new Japan. 
And so for a parallel set of photographs, um, on the left-hand side, you see her here in her traditional wear. This is a photograph taken by the same person who took the imperial photographs back in 1872. Um, and then on the right-hand side, a view of her in obviously a Western-inspired gown on the, uh, in the years 1888 to 1890 or so. So whereas the exhibition downstairs makes the point that kimono-style gowns became faddish for Westerners during this time, um, such as the gown that you see on the left-hand side and then uh, frequently appearing in painted images, such as the one on the right-hand side. Um, I think the point can be made that this is very much a kind of private and personal interpretation of this other style of dress, whereas in the case of Japan, it is this very, very public face of the country that they're trying to put forward. Um, the dress that you see here on the left is in fact not the one that she's wearing on the right, but this is one of the few that seems to be best preserved uh, examples of gowns that she did in fact wear. So styles of dress, new kinds of technology, new building techniques, um, new habits, new kind of social habits are all part of this trend towards modernization that appears in these kaika, a civilization and enlightenment prints. Um, as a final uh, two images to kind of comment on this, um, I share another triptych, again part of this kaika a style of imagery or school of imagery that captures this sort of public uh, performance aspect that I'm trying to hint at. And uh, it also became the custom in the 1880s for the Japanese to entertain uh, particularly foreign you know, uh, diplomats and heads of state in a large public hall at which both women and men were expected to wear Western dress and do crazy things like Western style ball dancing. And so there are some number of prints that, that uh, capture this as well. And I don't think that you can um, del deliberately identify the Empress or any people in this print, but it's very much kind of in the spirit of its times of this moment. Um, however, I wanted to also reiterate that this type of activity that I'm talking about, and particularly with clothing, is very much contained to the elite as far as women are concerned in Japan. So men basically were expected to wear Western dress, particularly in their public life, um, from the early 1870s. That is captured here on the photograph you see on the left, which is basically a self-portrait by a photographer, but shows very, very typical dress for men at this period of time. But women, if you are not part of that very elite sort of you know, political elite um, who were expected to wear Western gowns, it was not really a fashion that got great uh, traction among the Japanese women. So it would be far more typical to see women wearing traditional kimono. Um, if you did have something like a portrait photograph taken, you might have a kind of Western background setting, but you would still be wearing conventional clothing. Um, this movement, or sort of sub-school of woodblock print imagery known as kaika A, um, ultimately comes to an end around the time of 1889, which is when the Meiji promulgation is issued, excuse me, Meiji constitution was issued. Um, and this is the first modern Japanese constitution um, based on Western precedents. Um, and again, there are a number of prints that actually show the official kind of uh, endowment of this constitution, um, most of which will also have the empress as part of the audience witnessing the promulgation of the constitution. And so um, in some ways you can say that this moment in Japanese political history kind of brings an end to this roughly two decade period of them actively trying to show the process of modernization taking place within Japan, essentially. Um, so the first two sections here, I've been talking about, about print imagery, but there is actually a lot of, um, there are a lot of advances that take place in other types of arts as well. And so the last section of my talk, I want to focus on one of these in particular, and that is yoga. Um, this translates as Western painting, but which could mean any one of a range of uh, painting or drawing practices, but really it becomes more or less simultaneous with oil painting, Western oil painting. Um, if you know much about conventional Japanese painting techniques, you may know that oil painting is not used in Japan uh, almost at all up until the opening of the modern period in the 1860s. Um, <clears throat> 
In general, scholars often divide the advent or development of oil painting into kind of two main phases, the first one of which really takes place within Japan in the 1860s and 1870s, although it does continue onwards, um, and then the second one of which dates to more or less the 1890s and forward and involves artists typically traveling abroad, especially to Paris, which of course is the art capital of the world during this period of time. Um, the first stage is rather more conventional. The second stage gets a little bit more innovative. And of the first stage, um, one of the painters who is considered to be most significant in that phase is uh, a work of his is shown here. His name was Takahashi Yuichi. Um, he actually experimented with oils more or less on his own in the 1860s at something called the Institute for the Study of Barbarian Books, which was a, a sort of government, shogunal government um, institution that was founded in the 1850s, just as Japan is starting this process of opening. Um, and then after he studied there, he learned from another British artist who came to Japan, who was actually a reporter for Western publications, named Charles Wergman, also in the city of Yokohama. And so of his best known works, this is one, a portrait of the Meiji Emperor. Um, obviously it is kind of closely linked to the photograph, which I'll show again in a second. But to kind of make the point about how different and new this is for Japanese painting, um, what you see on the right here is a typical portrait of an emperor. Um, hand in hand with the idea of oil portraiture, I'd like to emphasize that even the idea, the conventions of portraiture and public portraiture and portraiture of public figures is actually a radical change under the influence of Western ideas compared to conventional or traditional Japanese painting. Um, some of the things that oil allows one to do are to create a really much more kind of realistic sense of three-dimensional volume by using typical standard artistic techniques like uh, chiaroscuro, shading, perspective, um, and also oil allows for a kind of, um, you know, it has a kind of viscous uh, capability that allows you to really kind of capture the effects of lighting in a way that you really cannot do with traditional Japanese pigments and materials. So the painting on the left obviously is very you know, similar in terms of its appearance compared to the photograph on the right, um, but this is again a new kind of media, a new kind of materials and so forth that are being introduced to Japan at this time. Um, Takahashi Uchi also did landscapes. Um, this one is actually a little atypical for this period because it's a little bit lighter in palette than a lot of early Japanese oil paintings are, but um, it does a, quite a masterful job of showing this kind of reflective capability of oil that is something that's very, very new to this Japanese audience. Um, so while Takahashi Yuichi is maybe the most important early figure where Japanese oil painting really starts to take off is when foreign instructors are brought to Japan as part of the, the official sort of government attempts to modernize, they actually brought experts in any one of a number of industries into Japan to teach the Japanese. And the visual arts, this is one of the areas in which this occurs. Um, so they brought um, in the 1870s, 1876, three Italian artists to teach at the new Technical Fine Arts School. Um, and of those three, Antonio Fontanese, who you see here in this photograph, was hired to teach oil painting. How painters learned in this school was a very, very sort of conservative and traditional Western approach to training, academic style painting, which I will touch upon again in just a second. And so to repeat, for the most part, oil paintings that are produced in the 1870s and 1880s tend to be kind of conservative looking overall. They have a sort of darker palette. Um, there are new things happening in terms of subject matters that I don't quite have time to touch on, but maybe we can talk about that in the discussion if it comes up. Um, in the second phase, what happens is now there start to be a lot more foreign, uh, excuse me, a lot more Japanese artists traveling to Paris, traveling to the West to actually learn in Paris. Um, and so there are a number of artists who start to do this in the 1890s. Uh, you see a group of artists here from around the year 1900, including the one that I'm going to mention primarily, uh, artist named Kuroda Seki, who's right at the center of this particular photograph. So uh, Kuroda Seki, in fact, went to Paris to study law, and after a couple of years was convinced to shift his focus and instead studied, uh, started to study oil painting. Um, he joined the studio of a Western painter, French painter named Raphael Collin, and he was actually not the only uh, Japanese student in that studio at the time, um, but probably the one who became the best known because he had a great influence when he went back to Japan. Um, the training here was academic now, so I've mentioned that phrase already, but what that means is really drawing from the figure, 
So starting with drawing from plaster busts and then moving on to nude models, live models, um, and then going on to generate oil paintings based on those studies. This is a very kind of conventional approach to Western artistic training during the period. Um, what was distinctive about Collins studio and what Kuroda also picked up was that they started to have a kind of, um, not quite impressionist, but has some links with impressionist type of influence. And this had to do with plain air painting, or the idea of going outside and sketching from life in the actual natural light. And so unlike the earlier oil paintings, which as I mentioned, tend to be quite dark overall, you start to see a much lighter color palette in these and a kind of looser uh, brushwork. And this is, again, not quite impressionistic, but definitely a sort of a fusion of impressionistic elements. Um, the figure drawing is something that is quite radically new to the Japanese. Um, although nudity in general certainly was not something that was hidden in traditional Japanese arts, you might be familiar with the genre of shunga, the pornographic uh, woodblock print pictures. Um, what is new is this idea of actually drawing from the figure and also the idea that images of the figure are okay to put on display in public places, which is gonna be the kind of conclusion to my comments today. So here you see two examples of Kuroda's training in drawing the figure, uh, basically dry, drawing from live models. Um, and again, you can also see this kind of fusion of the plein air style that I mentioned. So he has a lighter color palette in general and a kind of loose brushwork. Um, ultimately, he brought these two things together in what was considered to be a very iconic image at the, at the time. This is produced in 1893. He was still living in Paris at this time, um, and this painting was in fact put on display. It was accepted into one of the more sort of prestigious salons at the, uh, at the time in 1893. Um, and he decided to, to return home shortly after this, and so he brought this with him and in turn put it on display in a large national exposition in Japan in 1895. But the problem is that both the technique as well as the subject matter were very, very atypical for Japanese art, even for oil painting at the time. The Japanese, even under Fontanese's influence, did not learn from the figure. They actually learned their Western style painting by copying drawings and copying photographs. So when it was on display back in Japan, there was a great outrage, which is captured here very humorously on the right-hand side uh, by French artist Georges Bigot, who is a kind of caricaturist living in Japan at the time, does many, many humorous illustrations of this type for, uh, again, Western presses. Um, so what exactly was the issue? Um, I think that there are a few things that made it particularly provocative, um, and one has to do with its size. In the illustration, you will notice this is actually kind of close to the actual size. So this is not a small pornographic woodblock print, you know, 10 or so inches wide, but rather a life-size painting. Um, in addition, the nude figure is a Western woman, a foreign woman. Um, and then there's also something about the, the oil material itself, as I mentioned, kind of uh, implied or referred to. It had the capability to create a kind of realism that is really lacking in conventional or traditional Japanese art. Um, and there are more complex issues as well, but these are kind of three things to highlight, I think, about the um, provocative nature of this particular image. Um, again, I presume many people in this room are kind of quite familiar with Japanese traditional art, but if you're not, the image on the right here would give you an idea of what the traditional Japanese approach to a nude figure might be. And you will notice uh, that kind of flatness of form and overall sort of abstract appearance, whereas Kuroda's use of oil takes this to a, a level that's much more kind of quote unquote realistic. So, Kuroda, when back in Japan, uh, becomes immensely influential because he now introduces this lighter color palette and this looser brush style, um, again, sort of leading into, or similar to Impressionism, into traditional um, oil painting training in Japan. Traditional is probably not quite the right word to, to use there, but by this time there are official schools, official art schools set up within Japan, and he becomes the head of the the Department of Western Painting, the first department of Western Painting at uh, one of these national schools. And so he starts to teach others this as well. So uh, now that color palette and his uh, techniques are applied to native subject matters, matters such as this, which is a Maiko or a geisha girl in training, um, this painting, which is particularly well known, showing a woman sort of casually dressed by a, a lakeside, and then also 
uh, he turned his attention to landscapes as well. So he does, you know, plenty of both categories of subject matter. Um, again, very, very sort of uh, bright colors, much more in keeping with sort of impressionistic and impres post-impressionistic paintings that are being produced in the West at this time. So to conclude and wrap this up so we can start our discussion, um, what I tried to do today is basically just try to convey some kind of parallel things that are happening in Japan precisely at the same moment that is covered in the exhibition. So it is by no means the case that there is a one-way flow of influence and information going from Japan to Western artists, but rather there is just as much innovation and excitement and kind of synthesis of new ideas into conventional ideas happening in the reverse as well. Um, in the case of what I've shown you today, represented first by the Yokohama A Print School, um, secondly, by the Kaika A Civilization and Enlightenment Prince, and then finally by a couple of different interpretations or advances in oil painting, Western style painting. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that wonderful kind of introduction to looking west. Um, and of course, here in the Bay Area, it's sort of like we're right in the in the middle because. Um, Really, we look east. Looking east for us is the east coast of the United States. It's not, we think of looking west when we think about Asia. Um, could you speak a little bit more about, uh, you didn't touch on photography at all, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about photography, what was happening, um, and uh, if there are any works in the exhibition that you would encourage people to go and have a, another look at. Sure. Um, Um, right, so in, within Japan, photography actually in a lot of ways is very much considered to be a tool of modernization. It is used by the government in an official capacity to document new, new developments um, that include, you know, port development uh, in the city of Hokkaido, for example. Um, it is used to document the wars, a sort of civil war leading up to the actual official Meiji period as well as um, later wars. Um, it is appreciated by the public as a kind of um, entertainment that also shows that they're sort of behaving in a modern fashion in a lot of ways. And this is, you know, particularly how it's used in the 1870s and 1880s, I think. The exhibition downstairs has some fascinating photographs in this room over here, which are Western artists um, inspired by Japanese motifs in particular, I think. Um, the photographs in the exhibition would fall under the category of pictorial photography. And there are actually also very similar things happening in Japan a little bit later in the, in the 19 teens or so. So there's, that's yet another area where there's actually quite a lot of back and forth happening. And one of the things that I've been fascinated about this exhibition is um, there's a whole section about women and Im both images of women and of course some of them are made by women, um, most famously Mary Cassatt. Um, some of them really to me speak to this changing role of femininity in, in both cultures, um, which is fascinating to see, the, um, and particularly with the Empress as um, a sort of figurehead, but not something that is being um, t uh, shared amongst other women in Japan. Um, but could you speak a little bit about the role of women both as uh, sort of subjects of art, subjects for art, for a male gaze, if you will, and of course some of the women were artists, also maybe making art for the male gaze. Um, could you speak to that as well in the Japanese context? You sort of touched on it with that nude by Kuroda Seki, but it wasn't so much about female nudity necessarily as it was just the shock of nudity. I'm wondering if we could tease out a little bit more about uh, pictures of women and the feminine, uh, maybe uh, femininity as an iconic subject. Yeah, so there are a lot of complicated threads in that set of questions that one could talk about. Um, you know, if you're familiar with traditional woodblock prints, you know that one of the earliest subject matters that they focused on was the woman of the pleasure quarters, the floating world. And um, I think that there is, you know, obviously a lot of that uh, type of material, um, certainly it can be argued, was designed for a male gaze. Um, when it comes to the 
period of modernism, I, I think actually things are quite different in Japan versus the West. Um, for one thing, you, you, I mean, you do have females as subjects like these, but I think more than the interest in their, you know, interest in them being tied to their gender, it, it's about this kind of fusion of um, Western ideas into Japanese modernity that's not so much about gender. Um, but at the same time, women do become a kind of emblem for the state of Japan specifically in the 1890s and early 1900s. Um, and I think if you look at other cultures, you see a lot of use of female figures as a kind of symbol for the nation as well, um, which is not the greatest answer to your question, but just something that I think kind of comes up in thinking about the material. Um, I will note, it, there are hardly any female Japanese artists during this period. It's actually quite, quite unusual. Um, we, we just, we don't have very many until, you know, 1920s and later, I think. Great. Okay, I'm going to turn to some of your questions now. Um, let me just have a quick... So, uh, this is uh, about the Yokohama A and the Kaika A styles. Um, you talked about them ending. Um, could you talk more about why they ended? So, um, Yokohama A is really really restricted to this very, very short period of maybe five years that has to do specifically with the port of Yokohama opening. Um, why do they end? I think because the culture shifts and changes and then there is a much more kind of um, integrated interaction between the two sides, whereas in the Yokohama A, you can see it's very much about the Japanese artists looking at this thing that's just like totally foreign, right? And they don't quite know what to make with it in a sense. Um, Kaika A has a much longer lifespan, um, but I would say it starts to come to an end because the Japanese do start to feel as though they have been successful in achieving their aim of modernization and sort of demonstrating to the world, to the rest of the world, that they're capable of being, um, you know, interacting on a on an equivalent level. Um, and there are actually two significant wars that are directly related to that, which I didn't have time to go into. The first is the Sino-Japanese War, which takes place in 1894, 95. Um, there is actually a whole genre of war prints specifically that depicts that war. 1904-1905 is the other war, which is the Russo-Japanese War, and that one does not see the same type of prints being made. And the reason in there has to do with the technological advances in photography. So in other words, photography is not really the best tool to photograph battle scenes and convey the war in 1894-95, but by 1904-1905, it actually is. And so the death of Kaikae is kind of tied to both of those things, I think, uh, or th three things, right? The Japanese successfully sort of demonstrating their civilization capabilities. Um, they do this through the war, and then also photography arrives and sort of changes visual culture in a new way or not photography arriving, but rather tech, you know, technical, technical advances. And there was a question that sort of um, relates to that uh, point, the war, um, documenting war and those two important wars that really brought Japan a lot of respect, you know, um, in, in a global sense for being a country that could, um, you know, beat China and beat this, um, Russia. And uh, if you read Western or, you know, like American newspaper articles from that time period, there's this real sort of cheering for the underdog almost for, for Japan being able to, um, it, it kind of surprising people with its, um, you know, military uh, sophistication, which then, of course, um, gets a little bit um, intensified in the next couple of decades. Um, someone asks, how did the role of the military change? Um, the emperor, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the emperor, and was it ever depicted in art? So it sounds like there's interest yeah. in knowing more about that. Absolutely. And so in response to your comments, let me add, yes, the West was quite enamored of the Japanese, um, you know, especially how successful they were in those two wars. But if you were to go back and look at those primary sources, of course, there's an awful lot of racism in how they talk about it. Like, oh, those amazing little Japs, look at them. They defeated the, you know, the Chinese and then the Russians. Um, so the question of the war and the military is a great one because, um, again, I didn't have time to go into much depth in this talk at all, but as part of the shift in 1868 when Japan, you know, enters the Meiji period, um, 
literally just about every major type of cultural entity changes. In pre-Meiji Japan, of course, you have a military class that is the samurai class, which has different ranks. That class is abolished as of the early Meiji period. And so um, the Japanese no longer have the samurai class, but instead they start to adapt a Western-based military model uh, from the Prussians and the French, basically. So. Part of the new technology that they adapt is new military technology because they had not gotten anything from the outside world from, for that 250 year period. And if you are, you know, even a, know a tiny bit of history, you know that the Industrial Revolution was taking place in the West in the late 18th and 19th century. So there's an awful lot of new technology that the Japanese start to pick up after the Meiji period begins, and military technology is definitely part of that. Great. Um, Let's see, there's another question here that asks about uh, the, uh, um, your Western artists looking east. So this is of course the subject of the exhibition and, and um, it, it goes into that, but could, uh, this person wants to know a little bit more about, uh, did similar things happen when Western artists were looking to Japan, were there Japanese art schools in the West? Um, did Westerners visit Japan to study in the same way? Yeah, that's a great great question. Um, there were definitely no like official Japanese art schools. There were many foreigners who traveled to Japan. Um, and um, like not really official Japanese art schools, but what immediately comes to mind is Arthur Wesley Dow, who I think is you know mentioned in the exhibition. He became quite enamored of the Japanese arts, for example, and published a book called Composition, which focuses uh, in particular on the Japanese concept of noton, which is loosely translated as like shading or uh, tonality. And that was a bestseller. You can actually still find it easily on Amazon. It's in like its 20, gazillion, 20 gazillionth printing. But um, that was a kind of a standard text that I think a lot of artists would have looked at in the early 20th century. And so there wasn't really the same kind of official, um, you know, academic, uh, academi academic um, structuring of Japanese lessons and so on, but um, it was much more sort of, you know, free form, I think. And m many of us here in San Francisco are aware that we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Panama Pacific International Exposition. And expositions like that were one of the ways that Western artists became aware of um, Japanese export art and design motifs and uh, woodblock prints. So could you speak a little bit about the importance of the World Expo? Yeah, absolutely. So the Japanese, right, exhibitions, uh, world's expositions are huge, huge business from, you know, 1850 through maybe even 1950 or so. And so the Japanese actually were represented at some of these prior to the Meiji period, but once the Meiji period began, um, they were very active participants. Um, they sent a lot of art, uh, industrial art that was actually deliberately designed to appeal to those kinds of Western uh, venues, uh, because of course part of what an exhibition is about is a sales opportunity. Um, but they also exported traditional materials as well. Um, one of the best known cases of that is the 1893 Columbia World's Exhibition, where they actually recreated a um, Japanese um, historical building on a little wooded island uh, in the middle of that exposition. And um, so that was probably one of the places in which a the, you know, a great number of Westerners would have first encountered and been able to see Western, excuse me, Japanese art, whether traditional or deliberately sort of produced for the, for the market. And in fact, if you've ever been to Hakone Gardens, that was inspired by um, a San Francisco woman visiting the uh, Japanese pavilion at the earlier expo that was um, down in the marina, which I'm forgetting what it was called right now. But... Um, Okay, this is a fascinating question because a lot of us uh, in the United States know about um, the Emperor of Japan being thought of as a, a kami or a, a deity, if you will, and that it was a huge deal when his voice was first heard over the broadcast announcing um, the surrender of Japan in World War II. So, ha so backing up to these image, these early images of the Japanese emperor, both in Western and traditional garb, how did the Japanese reconcile that view of the emperor as kami with this very human photographic image? That, that is also a great question. What a great audience. You're asking questions or exactly things that I wanted to talk about and couldn't, so thank you for that. Um, so 
the whole modern history of the emperor is quite fascinating. I mentioned in my presentation that during the Edo period, he, the, the imperial family is basically, you know, sort of kept within the imperial compounds in the city of Kyoto. This is not to say that they were in prison, because as you can probably imagine, the imperial compounds are, are vast. But for some extended period of decades, if not longer, um, it would not have been unusual for the emperor to leave the imperial grounds. However, there always was an emperor who, at least in principle, shared political power with the shogun, right? The shogun was the military rule, the emperor was technically sort of the head of government in traditional Japan. Um, in theory, in practice, really, the, the shogun controlled everything. So when the Meiji period began, um, the government oligarchs were very deliberate in using the person of the emperor to help sort of change the population's opinions and help really formulate an idea of Japan as a state, right, as, a, as a, an entity. Um, and how they first did this was very early in the Meiji period, there was actually a kind of official um, sort of rolling out of the emperor where he traveled very publicly from the city of Kyoto to the city of Tokyo, which is now the new modern capital. And he does that in public, and there are charming little sort of folk illustrations of this, of the population, you know, seeing the caravan go by and bowing down to the ground, of course, because they just, you know, it's just a complete mystery what the entity of the emperor is as he travels around. Once he's ensconced in Tokyo, the photograph that you saw here, the modern photograph, actually is fairly early on circulated to try to get the population kind of used to the idea of the emperor, right? Um, and they really sort of try to make him this public figure. But that doesn't last so long, because after a period of maybe a few years, a decade, they start to restrict access to his image again. Um, and as part of that first phase, he also goes on this series of imperial progresses throughout the country, so he can see the land, see the people, see the country, and also be seen. But by the time you get to sort of the end of the 19th century, access to him and his pictures is kind of reined in once again. And um, so that's sort of what happens during the Meiji period. And then, of course, uh, in the 20th century and leading up to World War II, um, he takes on an increasingly iconic role as this deified head of state, which, yes, absolutely is kind of shattered when he comes on the radio broadcast after surrendering to announce the surrender of the Japanese. So it's very, very kind of complicated in intricacies that shape that process over the period of, um, you know, 70 or 80 years or so. Thank you. Um, okay, a couple of questions about... Um, uh, how people were able to purchase Western style clothing in Japan early on, and maybe somewhat related to, because it's probably around the same time, um, does Dejima still exist, and how did it evolve after having this um, Western contact? So maybe you need to say more about what Dejima is. Um, I can't fully answer the question of how Dashima evolved after the fact, um, but it does still exist. You can still go there, and there is a kind of like Dutch town in Nagasaki today that you can visit. Um, I confess it's one of the few places in Japan I have not been, which is why I can't say too much about it. Um, to the issue of clothing, um, so men were actually encouraged and even required to change to Western dress shortly after the Meiji Emperor changed his clothes. And so I think it's probably fair to say that the um, department stores started to sell that. Takashi Maya, who manufactured the woman's dressing gown downstairs, um, that was actually a um, textile business for many centuries before the period under discussion, although it wasn't a department store because we didn't really have that uh, title. Um, but I, I think it's fair to say that those kinds of places would have started to sell men's clothes in particular. Um, for both men's and women's Western style clothes, what has to be appreciated is that the um, tailoring is radically different from traditional Japanese dress. Kimono is very, very simple garment. If you hold it up, it's basically like a T-shape, and it's made with simple stitches. And it's my understanding that traditionally you actually unstitched your kimono to wash it and then you stitched it back together. Um, women's dresses in particular, obviously, of the late 19th century with bustles and, um, you know, all kinds of flourishes involved a very, very complex style of tailoring that was unknown in Japan. So this is actually yet another area where Western experts had to be brought in and taught Japanese to start to learn um, the tailoring to make Western clothing. So now I wanted to maybe turn to a slightly more like 
present day conversation that's been happening uh, at this museum and in the wider community about the issue of cultural appropriation. And uh, in, in the uh, resource room downstairs, we have a kind of feedback wall where we're inviting people to comment on this issue of um, is this appropriation or is it appreciation or is it somewhere in, in the muddy middle? And there's actually a very pithy comment on the wall right now that says, um, thank goodness Van Gogh and um, Monet didn't have to grapple with these um, uh, with this confused, uh, with these confused arguments or something like that, um, because maybe that would have prevented them from um, the appropriation that they were actually doing to make beautiful art that, you know, a lot of people really enjoy their art. Um, so one of the things that came up around um, the, uh, the institution where this exhibition originates is the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And this museum was very fascinated to observe um, this discussion that happened. A lot of people refer to it as Kimono Gate. Have you, ha has anyone heard of Kimono Gate? If you have, raise your hand. Oh, wow, okay. So um, maybe I'll show a slide. Would it be sure. interesting to just sort of, um, totally changing gears. And so, this is um, an invitation on the Museum of Fine Arts, and, and I'm not trying to um, criticize the museum at all. I think that they had very good intentions behind um, what they're doing. But what happened was, um, the end result was a very rich discourse within the museum, and that's something that I think um, is really exciting to me as a museum educator, that museums can be places where people can uh, discuss issues that really matter to them. It's kind of a safe space. So what happened was is um, there's a famous painting in their collection which unfortunately did not come with um, our version of this exhibition of um, it's uh, Camille Monet, the wife of the artist, posing in a Japanese kimono uh, with a fan and a wig. And the museum invited visitors to try on a replica of this kimono that was actually carefully made using traditional techniques in, in Japan. And of course, kim the kimono industry is dying in Japan. So um, it's pretty amazing that there are still artists, artisans who can make these beautiful garments. And then visitors were invited to come in and dress up and um, channel their inner Camille. Well, this resulted in, in, in them being protested. So, but there were protesters in the galleries saying, um, you know, uh, decolonize the museum and um, basically saying that this is sort of um, an Orientalist exercise. So, staff at this museum were, you know, really watching this and wanting to um, learn from this experience so that we don't create similar upset, um, and also that we would al enable people to continue the discussion. So I'm just wondering um, what you're, if I mean, you were probably watching this thing unfold and, you know, what your students might have been talking about uh, at, at your university. So I, I think, I mean, my understanding of the, <clears throat> particularly the points that were, um, you know, that the protesters were not happy about is that there wasn't very much contextualization given to this. And so it was really just a, a you know, a case of kind of dressing up like the other um, that provoked this sense of outrage. And it's probably worth also saying that they were counter protesters. There were plenty of counter protesters saying we don't understand what the big deal is. Um, and ultimately, I think those of us who are professionals that work in museums and teach about this material um, feel that it's just important to provide contextualization for this information. Um, I teach a set of courses which regularly introduces um, impressionist use of Japanese material, um, among many other topics, it's a set of classes that's about Eastern and Western culture meeting. And despite the fact that the class covers, you know, 500 years of content and addresses India, China, and Japan as, as well as the West, I can tell you without fail that there's always a huge number of students who are interested in precisely this material, the, the impressionist kind of, um, you know, influence on, um, excuse me, Japanese influence on impressionism and post-impressionism. Um, and even after studying it for several weeks, they still often have very kind of, obviously, 
you know, oversimplified interpretations of it. So I think it's important just to, as you said, kind of continue a dialogue about it. Um, but I also think it's important to recognize that, um, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that there has been a dialogue going back and forth between the West and Japan that extends for 150 years um, in many ways that, you know, each side has kind of shaped the other culture in um, numerous, numerous ways, right? Are there any um, additional comments or questions from, from the audience? Now that we've piqued your <laughs> curiosity about how this material might be quite controversial and rich for further discussion. Anybody? Oh. Great. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for, for being you. here.